Well, greetings in Jesus. Wonderful to be with you as always. Uh, we'll do Kiddush Shabbat after the teaching tonight, which will be the introductory one. Again, my humble, apo humble apologies for the 20 minute delay. It's been an excruciating day for reasons I won't bore you with. But let's go to the Lord of Prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for your goodness, your kindness, and mercy, for the blood of your Son that cleanses us from all sin. We do ask, Lord, you meet with us now in the power and presence of your Spirit, pouring your Spirit upon us. Speak to us, Lord God, and let us not hear through a man or through men only, but through men by your grace that we may hear the voice of your Spirit expounding your word. More than this, Lord God, as always, we ask for the wisdom and courage to be not only hearers of your word, but doers also. In Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake. Amen. How to begin? Where we came from, where we're going, why we left and why we came. Most of you know we're in a post-denominational era. And there's really not a need for me to speak a lot about what's wrong with the church and what's happened in the last 25 years, particularly most of you know it. We'll go through some things, but I don't want the focus to be what we all know has gone wrong. I want the focus to be what's going to happen now. What's going to be right? Yet, there's no getting around certain things. In contemporary pop culture in the United States and Britain, and particularly in music lore, there's a Faustian legend that is popular among many young people, and even people of my generation, beginning in the hippie year of the 1960s to the present day. It concerns something called the crossroads, and it's really a Faustian legend. The story goes that the Afro-American blues guitarist, Robert Johnson, who many people consider to be the forefather of rock and roll and of rhythm and blues, met at the intersection of two highways in the Mississippi Delta, south of Memphis, near a place called Clarksville, Mississippi, at the junction of what was then Highway 61 and Highway 49. And there he sold his soul to the devil to get an uncanny musical ability that was beyond his own means to play the way he did. Well, that's the legend. And he certainly did change his style of playing guitar, and it certainly did influence further generations. It was immortalized by Eric Clapton in this country. Robert Johnson's Eric Clapton's uh, almost uh, at the mentor he never met. And by Bob Dylan in the United States, who actually did an album called Highway 61. And he drew on this imagery, this biblical imagery of the crossroads, which of course comes from the book of Ezekiel chapter 21. Bob Dylan would sing, God said to Abraham, kill me a son. Abe said, Lord, you must be put me on. Where do you want to kill him, Don? He told him on Highway 61. He drew on this imagery from, from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 21, where the king of Babylon met Ezekiel. Uh, and we know, of course, from Isaiah 14, that the king of Babylon is always a metaphor for the devil, a metaphor for Satan. And he was there with all these occult practices that were deceiving the nations, of uh, the nation, occult practices. <laughs> Well, anyway, according to the legend, the devil came to claim the soul of Robert Johnson after a few years of fleeting fame, and he died at the age of 27. And since that time, it's pointed out that uh, Kurt Cobain and uh, most recently Amy Winehouse and 
Jim Morrison from The Doors, and Jimi Hendrix from Janis Joplin, and Brian Jones from The Rolling Stones, they were all 27 when they died. And it becomes attributed to this popular legend or myth, or call it what you want, the idea of the crossroads. Well, that's simply contemporary culture. That's simply music war. But the teaching of the crossroads is a very real one in the Word of God. A very real one. Before my siblings and myself forced my aging mother, who's still unsaved, to relocate up to New York, New Jersey to be near family, she lived in Florida in a Jewish retirement community, and we made her leave because of the hurricanes. She's getting too old to handle the evacuations on her own, and we basically forced her to get out. Then we let her snowbird for a while, just spend a good months there. But we basically forced her to get out out of there. Uh, but when I would visit her, I would attend what was the largest evangelical church in North America, probably the largest evangelical church in the developed world, or at least in the Western world, the largest. It was a church that had 25,000 members and 40,000 in attendance every Sunday. I would drive on the interstate, the American equivalent of a motorway, and every Sunday morning I went to that church, there would be traffic jams. And the police would be there with the lights on trying to clean up the traffic jams because there were thousands, thousands of cars trying to get into the car park of this church. Multiple services on a Sunday. 40,000 people. 40,000. The largest evangelical church in the United States and Canada, the largest probably in the Western world that I know the largest, 40,000 people. Twice the size of Joe Austin's thing in Texas, 40,000 people. There's nothing in Britain or Europe would even come remotely close to it in size. You'd have to go to the Far East to find, find a church that would come close, or Latin America that would even come remotely close to it. 40,000. I'd be stuck in a traffic jam like I was tonight coming up from London. <laughs> Six traffic jams in five hours. <laughs> but uh, every Sunday, a traffic jam, people trying to get to church. And they were scripturally evangelical, was the Calvary Chapel. And I thought this was rather impressive. And it was. Certainly, the numbers were impressive. And they had all kinds of famous people come. They had Benjamin Netanyahu speaking there and all kinds of things. They outed everybody. They outdid everybody. Well, as some of you know, when this was going on, the pastor was a serial adulterer. And a year and a half ago, he resigned. Left his wife and children. He took up a job in music management. He was involved in the management of a nightclub called the Funky Biscuit. Imagine going from the pastor of the largest evangelical church in the Western world to managing the funky biscuit. <laughs> Less than 24 hours ago, I printed this off this morning, the funky biscuit fired him because they found out that there are allegations and police investigations that he did something with a four-year-old little girl, at least a couple of them. Four-year-old! Four! This was the pastor of the largest evangelical church in the Western world. Certainly in the English-speaking world. Crazy. Four days ago, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender campaigners welcome Church of England guidance for schools. And of course, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Well, I'll read this one. He said, children at Church of England schools must be taught to revere and honor gay and lesbian people 
despite its centuries old teaching that homosexual acts are a sin. These are new rules to be published, the Archbishop of Canterbury insists. And children have to be taught at a young age that they have to discover their own identities. Now this comes from Lambeth, and to see these schools. You know what bothers me the most? Will Nicky Dumble say anything? Uh, no. Will N.T. Wright say anything? No. Will any so-called evangelical leader in the C of E utter a syllable of public protest? No. They haven't and they're not going to. It'll just be business as usual. Business as usual. Yeah, business as usual. <laughs> A Christian math teacher in Oxford faces being fired. Yeah. Yeah. Simply because he referred to a collective group of students as girls, and one of them was oh. <laughs> You couldn't, well, anyway. Last week, the leader of Hillsong in New York, Carl Lins, appeared on an American TV program, women's program, Vulcan View, very popular with certain kinds of women, and when asked, millions of people, is abortion a sin? He said, ultimately, God is the judge. We have to be true to our own convictions. Will that stop anybody from going to Hillsong? Or, no! Well, it's things like that. That's why I left. That's why I left the denominational system. That's why I left. And it's not just anyone particular. They're all going this way. I've asked a few friends, brothers in the Lord, who are in ministry to join me this weekend because I don't want to speak for them, I want them to speak for themselves. What was it that persuaded Chris Hill to leave the Anglican ministry? What was it that persuaded Ian Hudson to leave the Healing ministry? And what was it that would persuade a nice Jewish boy <laughs> who somehow winds up a Roman Catholic priest <laughs> was tentatively slated to be a bishop to arrive at the conclusion he rejects Talmudic Judaism and Roman Catholicism alike but he believes in Jesus. Amen. You'll get to hear these brethren tell their own stories for themselves. But I don't want the focus to be what's wrong. That's what's wrong. We know what's wrong. And it's not getting any better. People will not stand up and speak out. They won't. The clergy will not. Decent clergy have already left these denominations by and large. They're not going to do anything. They'll do nothing. The question is, what are we doing? And what are we going to do? Down at the crossroads. You see, it's reached a point now where you've got to make a decision. Yeah. There's no more sitting on the fence. There's no more, we'll decide when the time comes. There's no more, we're going to wait on the Lord and see what happens. Uh, it's obvious what's going to happen if you've been waiting on the Lord. Down at the crossroads. The Hebrew word is drachim, drachim, the roads. Look with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 6.
We begin in verse 12. Their houses shall be turned over to others, their fields and their wives together, for I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, declares the Lord. How many have you seen Caucasian women, English women, converted to Islam with Muslim husbands? How many have you seen churches that have been turned into mosques, like that huge one in the middle of Manchester? Yeah. For from the least of them, even to the greatest, everyone's greedy for gain. And from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone deals falsely. In popular Pentecostalism, again, I don't want to harp on this stuff, I can't tell you how many Pentecostal preachers I knew, and it's always of God in Elam, who admitted privately, this stuff is not biblical Pentecostalism, it's not traditional Pentecostalism, it's not the Pentecostal church we grew up in, this is wrong, privately. But when there's a property trust and a pension and a superannuation fund, we see the priorities. They heal the brokenness of my people, saying superficially, peace, peace. But there is no peace. Now, St. Paul the Apostle warns us in the New Testament that will be a sure sign of the end of the age. Ultimately, the Antichrist will bring a false peace to the Middle East, and people will think there's going to be a peace. At a time when the world has been on the precipice, they're going to buy into this agenda of the Antichrist. But it's not a new phenomenon. There is no shalom. Again, shalom from the Hebrew infinitive, veshalem, to pay, to fill, to fulfill. Were they ashamed because of the abominations they've done? They were not even ashamed at all. They didn't even know how to blush, writes Jeremiah. Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I will judge them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Look at this stuff. The funky biscuit. You gotta teach this to little kids in Anglican schools. They don't even know how to blush. And in verse 16, thus says the Lord, stand by the crossroads in some translations, the drafim, the ways, and see and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way is, and walk in it, and you shall find rest for your souls. The Lord is saying, there's a crossroads, a time and an hour of decision, if you look for the right way, I'll show you the right way. It's the way that's always been right. The true gospel. True doctrine. A godly standard of morality. I'll show you the way. And you'll find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk on it. I'm not going to go to that church or that fellowship or that house group. They're divisive. And I sent watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we're not going to listen. The warnings. I can't tell you how many people I know personally who warned. There was an older brother who went to be with the Lord named Stephen Gardner. He once wrote a book called Literally the Trumpet Sounds for Britain. He, way back he was trying to warn people. I remember Clifford Hill 20 years ago trying to warn people. I remember David Notes trying to warn people. And it's similar in America. Similar in America. There was an old time Pentecostal preacher named David Powell. He was trying to warn people many years ago. They were blowing the trumpet. They tried to warn one when it comes up. Well, look, they're not going to walk in it. They will not walk in it. It's a lost cause. The denominational systems are broken. 
it's over. I miss that. It's not going to happen. And the decline? The decline? Well, let's look at Psalm 127, verses 1 and 2. Unless the Lord builds the house, it cannot stand. They labor in vain who build it. The watchman keeps awake in vain. You can build it, but it cannot stand. My apologies to those who heard me say it. The first mega church built on marketing, Crystal Cathedral. Gone in a pop, 156 million U.S. dollars in debt. The biggest evangelical church in the Western world, Calvary Chapel, Fort Lauderdale. Overnight, doesn't matter. Goes in a pop. But what about the crossroads? Crossroads occur in various places in Scripture. Let's look at Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on Greek word, scopio, like same word for telescope or periscope or microscope. I urge you, brethren, keep your eye on, but a focused eye, like a periscope, okay? Keep your eye on those who cause dissensions and hindrances, contrary to the teaching which you've learned, and turn away from them. For such men are slaves, not of our Lord Christ, but of their own appetites. And by their smooth and flattering speech, they deceive the hearts of the unsuspecting. For the report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I am rejoicing over you. But I want you to be wise in what is good, and innocent in what is evil. And in verse 20, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. A polemic against triumphalism and kingdom now theology. The Lord conquers, not the church. Nonetheless, let's look at this. His appeal here is not to the bad ones. It's reached a point that's not an issue for Paul. No, he says, I'm rejoicing over you. I want you to be wise in what's good and innocent and what is evil. Innocent does not mean naive about it. <laughs> well, yeah, this stuff gets me frustrated, angry, sick. How can it not? But that's not what I'm thinking about. I'm thinking about how I'm rejoicing over people who know it's wrong, who say it's wrong, and are determined to follow Jesus no matter what the popular trends, not only in society, but now the church, say and do. Frustrated, angry, discouraged, all of that. But it doesn't stop me from rejoicing. It doesn't stop me rejoicing for my see those who are led by the Spirit of Jesus and Yeshua. As it gets darker, their light gets lighter, gets brighter. Now the crossroads here, the word in Greek is dikostasia, we'll get dichotomy. Dikostasia. You perhaps heard me explain this before. It is a fork in the road a fork in the road. The ones who stay 
on the true path. The ones who stay on the true path are not the ones who cause dissension. It is the ones who leave the apostles' teaching, the teaching of the New Testament. It is those who deviate from it who've left the true path. But because there are more of them than there are of you, us, and I say that only by God's grace, because they outnumber us, they will insist we are the ones who are divisive. Because we will not follow them up this detour, up this wrong road. That is not the ancient path. In fact, it is an ancient path. It's the same ancient path that Ezekiel encountered in chapter 21 of the book of Ezekiel. The devil is standing there with his occult wares. No, there's a crossroads. A crossroads. It just doesn't work anymore. Remember what Jesus said, and it's not only about the Roman church. Come out of her, my people. Lest you participate in her sins and share in her plagues. If you remain in something that has become this morally reprobate, this heretical, you become party to it. You become party to it. Now it's easy to target the Roman church. Every time they pray to the dead or worship transubstantiated elements, they're engaging in idolatry or necromancy. It's easy to target them. You can't practice Roman Catholicism without sinning. But we're no longer talking about the Church of Rome alone, or even mainly. Oh, our wow, vicar, he doesn't agree with this stuff. No, but he's taking money that you give to the Lord's work and he's putting it into a diocesan fund to subsidize the homosexual vicar in the next parish. You're participating in the sin. Therefore, you will share in the plague. If you don't agree with it, why are you picking up the bill for it? You can't stay in it when it goes that far. There's something about hurting children that gets God really angry. <laughs> He forgave a lot of sins, but not the sins of Molech, when they sacrificed the babies. They went too far. Jesus also said it would be better to have a millstone tied around your neck and be cast into the sea than to hurt a little one. This is the church doing it. The Church of England is doing it. They're mandating a curriculum. You've got to teach this stuff to little kids while they're little. And the world loves it. <laughs> How can you even begin to fathom this? But they don't blush. Not only do they not blush, but the so-called believers who go along with it don't blush. They love their religion more than they love Jesus Christ. Hear what I said? They love their religion more than they love Jesus Christ. Look with me to 1 Corinthians 11, 19. For there must be factions among you, that word had aces in order that those who are approved may have become evident among you. Perhaps a slightly better Greek translation would be factions or heresies among you to prove which is true. Heresy is designed, allowed at least in God's economy, to cause a division, to separate the true church from the harlot church. 
Again, they have made an idol of unity that is not the unity of the spirit. They've made an idol of unity that is not the unity of the spirit. Think of the Roman church. It's based on an institutional unity with a hierarchy. But it's fragmented in terms of what people in it believe, even what different religious orders believe, and always out there. But it falsely professes unity because it has a structural, organizational, legal unity. Again, you perhaps, not for the first time, heard my slight comment. The denomination today is simply a property trust and a superannuation fund for ministers with a tax deduction. That's what a denomination is. That's all it is. It's a superannuation fund for the retirement of ministers and a property trust and a tax deductible status of the Charities Commission or something of that nature. That's all it is. That's all it is. Well, how should we understand these things? There's no way it was going to get any better. Look with me, please, to the situation the first believers found themselves in, the Messianic Jews of the first century, in the aftermath of the day of Pentecost. How shall we put? Turn with me to Acts chapter 2, please. Verse 46, day by day continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. There are two aspects of this. The first aspect is purely ecclesiological. You can do things in small groups you cannot do in big ones. And you can do things in larger groups you cannot do in small ones. People are never going to discover their own gifts in a big group. They're going to discover their own gifts in a house group. There is no scriptural mandate that the Lord's Supper must be taken in a big group. Your early Christians did it in house groups. Real fellowship will not take place in a mega church or even a big church. It takes place with people meeting in a home. On the other hand, there are certainly things that can be done in large groups that cannot be done in smaller groups. Okay, so think of this meeting or ones like we had in Scotland like this, where we have a, a day one in Manchester next week. Think of that as meeting in the temple. But all over the world, I find more and more Christians unable to find a good church where meeting in homes more and more. And it's going to end like that. The church is going to end up the way it began. I think most of us know that. That's one aspect. Let's look at the other aspect. They had their own meetings. And in Solomon's portico, they had big meetings, probably evangelistic in nature, because it says they were finding favor with the people on the Temple Mount. But they continued in Levitical worship. The temple was still standing and would stand until 70 AD, at which point Judaism, in its mosaic expression, ceased to exist and was replaced by rabbinism, by Talmudic Judaism. But up to this point, the temple was there. And they continued. So they thought, well, who we'll gets fed in a home group? <laughs> and we'll have fellowship and worship the Lord and talk about Jesus in our home group. But we'll continue going to the mainstream religious institution of the day. And it seemed 
to work for a while. Until persecution came. Sometime around 66 AD CE, <laughs> Nero had martyred Paul and Peter, according to the historical records of Eusebius and so forth. Most of the other apostles had already been martyred. Persecution was happening from Pagan that intensified greatly under Nero. But even before Nero, there was persecution. Even from the time of Tiberius, certainly Caligula, and so forth. In any event, persecution from the Sanhedrin was also intensifying. So they were being persecuted not just by the pagans, they were being persecuted by their fellow Hebrews. And some of them were thinking, why don't we just go back under the law? We can be safe that way. And I had to be reminded of something in Hebrews. Chapter 9, verse 8. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed, that is the Holy of Holies, while the outer tabernacle is still standing. They were forgetting the teachings of Jesus and the Oliver Discourse. They were forgetting the teachings of Daniel 9. The temple was going to be destroyed. The Hebrews were going to be scattered. There'd be another Judaism, according to Jeremiah chapter 2. That would not be scriptural. Jeremiah's famous broken system. They were forgetting this. They had a short-term view of things. They forgot that the destruction was coming and there was no security in what they were trying to do. Their only security would be in the Lord. And of course we know again from Eusebius and from Josephus that the believers who were united with Simeon, the cousin of Jesus, after the Apostle James was martyred, were rescued. When Titus lifted the siege temporarily, they got out of there. There was a rescue, as I've spoken about before. This is a major type of the rapture, historically. Nonetheless, the thing was under a death sentence. You may have grown up in a particular denomination or movement, doesn't matter which one, Methodist, Baptist, Elam, C of V, doesn't matter. They are under a death sentence. They have rejected the true Messiah. There's no alternative. They're finished. Don't hold on to something that is doomed. When the believers who lived in and around Jerusalem began selling their land and giving it to the church, the proceeds, well, if Jesus Christ appeared to you and told you that the city or town you lived in was going to be destroyed, wouldn't you put your house on the market? <laughs> They had that sense of getting out of here. But they began to lose that sense. And when things became difficult and persecution loomed, both from their own community and from the Romans, they began looking for a way to compromise. There are people, as we speak, believers, trying to find a way to compromise with this stuff. Trying to justify staying in a temple that is 
doomed by the hand of God for slaughter, for destruction. They'll argue. They'll try this, they'll try that. But what about those who see through it? Now understand, these issues have divided friends, and they've divided families, haven't they? They've even divided families. And it's going to become more like that. When you get to the crossroads, a choice must be made. I'm sorry for the others, but I'm rejoicing about people like you. And you're not the only ones. We had a conference in Northern Ireland, and I spoke at a church in Northern Ireland. The biggest mega church in the UK, the biggest in the UK was in Belfast, Whitewell. Had a very ugly split. I spoke at a church that was six, seven hundred people. <clears throat> Came to hear the ugly likes of yourself. How I get meetings like that in America maybe sometimes, but not, not over here. I rarely get more than 500. Well, once in a while, but only once in a great while. They let, it's happening. People are seeing. People are seeing. And I'm rejoicing to see. They realize the very basic truth that Jesus told us. Look with me, please, to Matthew chapter 9. and 17. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse pair results. As Isaiah put it, Kiel Bishani Big Day Yesha Magis Staka Yatani. He covered me with the garments of salvation. Told me with the robe of righteousness. I'm not saying these people were never saved, but there's a big hole in that garment, and you're not going to fix it with an unshrunk patch. They'll try, but it won't work. Nor do men put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst. Sorry to offend anyone's religion, but this meant that there was a fermentation reaction yielding a CO2 byproduct. Yes, Jesus did drink actual wine. And the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. A wine skin that's preserved and the new wine that's preserved. The rest isn't going to be preserved. I rejoice that no matter how desperate things become before the Lord comes, there's going to be people who are going to be preserved. There's going to be doctrine that's going to be preserved. There's going to be a moral standard, holiness, if you will, that is going to be preserved. There will be a true gospel that's going to be preserved. You just think of the charismatic renewal. Well, there's a lot we can say about it, but it comes down to one thing. They tried to put new wine than an old wineskin. 
they thought they could save these denominational churches without doing the radical change that needed to be done, like shrinking the patch before you sew it on. No, no. If you don't shrink the patch, it's only going to make a bigger hole. You can leave it in place, but you're going to wind up with this. This is what you're going to wind up with. This is what an unshrunk patch always leads to. People like you come to listen to people like me, not to be entertained. You come to listen to people like me because you know the Holy Spirit is telling you the same thing. He's telling that person seated next to you. He's telling that person seated in front of you. That he's telling that person seated on back of you. That he's telling the speakers and organizers. Or he's telling Allison and Dina, Javier, Alec. What he's telling Steve. What he's telling Tim from America. What he's telling our volunteers. What he's telling Chris Hill and Sheldon and Ian. That's what he's telling you. There's a new wineskin. <clears throat> we should not be discouraged. Disgusted, yes. Disgusted, appalled, yes. If, if you're not disgusted and appalled with this, there's something wrong with you. Disgusted and appalled, yes. I don't lose heart about it. No, don't lose heart at all. I'm well familiar with the Barna statistics and the Briarley statistics on church attendance and church growth. And they all agree church attendance is shrinking and evangelical church attendance is shrinking. And the churches that are growing are largely growing by transfer growth. People leaving one church for another to see the latest show in town, like that place in Liverpool and so forth. They always get that. But there's something they cannot calculate. There's something they cannot measure. They have no basis to tabulate it. It's not as dire or desperate as the published statistics make things out to be. More and more faithful Christians are meeting in homes. More and more faithful Christians are going to independent churches and fellowships outside of the mainstream denominational system. Sometimes they don't have buildings. Sometimes they meet in a school or a British Legion Hall or over a bookshop. They're meeting. You can't measure that. God doesn't want them measured. When persecution really comes, it's going to be harder to round them up. <laughs> but don't worry. God has counted every one of them. Amen. He's counted every one of them. Oftentimes, I reflect on the beautiful and noble Christian history of Great Britain and out of England. You think about it. Can you imagine Anglican vicars organizing mob riots against John Wesley for preaching the gospel? All over England. The clergy organized the riots. No wonder we preached on Wesley. <laughs> I guess today you'd have to get a motorcycle. <laughs> he had to stand on his father's grave over in Doncaster because they wouldn't let him in the pulpit where his father had been the vicar to preach the gospel. It's a true story. 
I think of the low lots, the followers of John Wycliffe, at a very, very dark time in this nation's history. Remarkable people, the low lots. This was way before the Reformation. Way before the Reformation, there was a Reformation in England. Well, I wouldn't call it a reformation, but it was certainly a move of God's spirit in England. Way before Luther and even before, even before John Wesley, he was a hundred years before Luther. Here in England, there was a powerful move of God among the Lowlands and the followers of John Wycliffe from Yorkshire. Our time, desperate. But there was people, there were people who came down to the crossroads and made the right choice. They didn't care about the cost. They realized that they couldn't fix the hole in that garment. They realized that the new wine could not go in that old wine skin. We're privileged. We not only have scriptural examples of faithful believers who face ways <coughs> and face it bravely. Not infrequently in the face of gruesome persecution. But we have historical examples peculiar to this nation. Peculiar to this nation. You see, believers were never really persecuted in the United States or Canada for being believers. They were persecuted for being believers in England and in Scotland. They really were. They really were. America got its evangelical heritage from Britain, from George Whitfield and people like that. That's what they got. Well. Look at the book of Job, chapter 32, please. <coughs> the one individual of Job's friends who spoke truth and made sense of the outlook. Behold, my stomach is like unvented wine. Like new wine skins, it's about to burst. Let me speak that I may get relieved. Let me open my lips and answer. Let me now be partial to no one, nor flatter any man. I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. He had a new wine skin filled with the right kind of wine, the new stuff and it was exploding within his gut. He was pleading with God to be able to open his mouth, say what he knew, knew to be true. If there's gonna be one characteristic of the people who are gonna have the right wineskin, it's gonna ferment inside of them explosively, it's going to be almost impossible for them to keep their mouths shut. No, Nicky Gumbel will not speak up. He won't speak up. Never. Don't expect anything from the Evangelical Alliance of any significance either. Don't expect it from Nigel Wright. Don't expect it from any of these people. No, they're just going to try to sow an unshrunken patch on the torn garment. But the people who make the right decision at the crossroads, they're going to plead with God. Give me the means, the courage, the anointing, the opportunity to open my mouth. And we're the only Methodists did in this country. In the example of John, John Wesley, the way that the 
no large good in this country, and to the example of John Wycliffe, William Tyndale, Robert Oxford, Red Leo Latimer, being burned alive by Queen Mary, play the man, an ivory land of fame in England, and I the powers of hell shall be able to extinguish this dying prayer. May God open the eyes of the king. They came to the crossroads. Do I go this way? Or do I go that way? Do I go to the left? Or to the right? Do I take the new road? Or do I stay on the ancient path? I think most of you have made a decision. Why else would you be coming to a place like this and listening to somebody like me? But understand what's coming. That wine is going to ferment inside of you. It's going to begin a up. And when the Lord tells you to open your mouth, nobody's going to be able to shut it. In the book of Acts, they tried to shut the apostles up, but it didn't work, did it? Yeah. Well, kick you out of the temple. The Church of England desperately, desperately tried to shut <coughs> John Wesley up. They desperately tried to shut him up. But they weren't. They desperately tried to shut up being pinned down, even after they killed him. His voice just got louder. You've got the Bible in the English language? It's because of him. They desperately, desperately tried to shut up John Wickley. They couldn't shut him up either. You come to the crossroads. You make the right choice. You make the right decision. I tell you by the Spirit of Jesus, they will not be able to shut you up either. God bless. See you in the morning.